Our guest this evening is Lindsay Adario, an American photojournalist based in London, where she photographs for the New York Times, National Geographic, and Time Magazine, among others. In 2000, she traveled to Afghanistan to document life under the Taliban. She has since covered conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Darfur, the Congo, and Libya, and shoots features primarily focused on human rights issues and humanitarian crises across the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa. Lindsay has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship in 2009. She was part of the New York Times team to win the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting for her photographs in Talibanistan, September 7, 2008. Lindsay's new memoir is It's What I Do, A Photographer's Life in Love and War. In conversation tonight with Lindsay Adario is Berkeley-based Tabitha Soren, who left a career in television in the late 1990s to devote herself to photography. Her work is in the collections of the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Ogden Museum of Southern Art, and the Oakland Museum of California. Please join me in welcoming Lindsay Adario to the JCCSF. Thank you all for coming. So I'm just going to get started right away. Everyone always asks me how a girl from Connecticut becomes a war photographer. <laughs> I just thought I'd show you a family portrait. <laughs> this is in the 70s. I grew up in a household uh, with a lot of hairdressers. So there were a lot of men who dressed as women and had mock weddings in the backyard in the summers. And to us, it was the most normal thing. We never, uh, my parents never said it was out of the ordinary. They just said, this is how your life's going to be. We will have parties, and the doors are always open to whoever comes in. And it was a household that really fostered creativity and love. And, and so <laughs> when I was about 12 years old, my dad gave me my first camera. It was a Nikon FG. And a client of his had given it to him. And I saw it and I asked for it, and he gave it to me. And I had no training, I just sort of bought a book on how to photograph, and I started teaching myself. And I studied international relations at the University of Wisconsin, and I never thought that I could be a photographer. To me, it was just not a viable profession. And after university, I moved to Argentina to study Spanish, and there I started going into the local newspaper and begging for a job. I have no idea why, but I thought maybe this was the profession I wanted to do. And I realized there that photography and photojournalism was really the marriage of photography, which I loved, which was an art, and a way of communicating. And so I moved back to New York in 1997, and I started freelancing for the Associated Press. And I worked in New York 97, 98, 99, and I was covering daily news, conferences, uh, protests, basic things. And I was really learning how to become a photographer. And in 1999, my mentor, Bobito Matthews, came to me from the Associated Press, and he said, we have a story that we think you would be perfect for, and it's on the transgender prostitution community in New York. And we think you can do it because it's going to require hanging out every single night for months on end and trying to gain the trust of this community that is very closed. And there were a series of murders in the transgender prostitution community, and they needed someone to really get in there. So I went for weeks and didn't take out my cameras and just hung around. And finally, they started inviting me to their homes, and that's when I created this body of work, and I spent about six months on it. Finally, in 2000, a, friend, a family friend asked me to move to India. He asked me to go to India with him. He was taking a group of students. He was a professor. And I started calling a bunch of newspapers and sending out emails and asking if they needed a freelancer in India. And luckily, a few people responded, not many. I was used to rejection at that point. And uh, I moved to India. I decided to just stay there and try and become a freelancer. And I rented a room from a guy who was the Dow Jones bureau chief in New Delhi. And he was working in Afghanistan at the time, and it was under the Taliban. And he came home from a long trip in Afghanistan, and along with about 16 Afghan carpets, he said, 
you know, you're a woman and you should go to Afghanistan and photograph women living under the Taliban. And I was 26 years old and I had about $5 in the bank and I said, okay, that's a really great idea. So <laughs> I uh, borrowed some money from my sister and I went. I sent out a bunch of emails to the UN and some small NGOs and I went. And I started, uh, there I really realized the strength of being a woman in these countries because I had access to women in a way that men did not. Uh, it's a, Afghanistan is a society that's deeply conservative and the women live uh, in most parts separate from the men. So I literally would go to homes and just knock on their doors and ask to come inside and meet with the women. And luckily they allowed me to photograph them probably because at that time there was no media coming into Afghanistan. There was no TV, uh, there were no newspapers. So the images would not make it back. And photography was illegal at the time. Under the Taliban, it was prohibited to photograph any living thing. I went to the maternity wards of hospitals. This is in 2000. This is how, these are the conditions of how women gave birth under the Taliban. In 2003, I wanted to cover the war in Iraq. I was living in Mexico City at the time and I moved to Istanbul to freelance for the New York Times. And I went into northern Iraq uh, with so many journalists who were waiting for the fall of Saddam Hussein. And after almost two months, Saddam did fall and we moved down to Kirkuk and covered the initial euphoria after the fall of Saddam. But very shortly after, it was clear that there was no, there was no plan for the aftermath. And uh, people became very frustrated. There was no electricity, very little water. This is at a, tank, a propane uh, tank distribution where people, at this time in Iraq, women cooked with propane tanks. That's how they fed their families and cooked for their families. And at distributions, there was no propane. So the military was in charge of actually di uh, distributing that. And people were getting so frustrated and the response was to gas them. I would go on night raids. This is where I really started doing embeds with the military. And so we would go into people's homes late at night, uh, round up the men. And as journalists, we weren't told very much at that time. We were basically, if we went on an embed, they said, okay, we're going into this hostile area. And we have intelligence that there are high level targets. And that's all we really were told. And they would round up the men and zip tie them and put bags on their heads. And we could shoot, we were just shooting. And, and for me as a photographer, I tried not to interfere, say anything, have any reaction. I was just documenting what I saw. And in, this is on my birthday actually, November 13th, 2000, 2004. I was working for Life Magazine. I got, my, I got an assignment with Life Magazine to go photograph injured soldiers coming out of Fallujah. And I had never, I had been covering the war in Iraq for almost two years at that point. And I had never seen injured soldiers like this. And in fact, the military let us in because the correspondent I was working with, his father and grandfather were both medics in some capacity with the military. And so they gave us access. And they let us photograph and, and report on anything we wanted. The only stipulation was that we had to get a signature uh, from every soldier I photographed. And if the soldier was unconscious, I could take that picture and get permission after. So uh, this was, we were under fire, and so there was red light being used, which travels at a less distance, so that's often what you use in a hostile area, or when you're under fire. And we walked into the inside of a C-17, it was a cargo aircraft, and the entire aircraft had been stripped, and there were just wounded soldiers lying everywhere. And this is how they were being flown to Ramstein. And this is just an image il illustrating how an injured soldier was flown to Germany at that time for treatment. Again, I had never seen anything like this. And when I got home from the assignment, I filed all the pictures to Life magazine as fast as I could. And the pictures never ran. And that was in November. And the pictures were held through December, January, February. And in February, I was in Azerbaijan on assignment for the New York Times, and I got an email from my editor at Life Magazine. And she said, I hate to write you this email, but we will never publish your pictures in Life Magazine because my editor has decided they're too strong for the American public to see. 
So I called Kathy Ryan, who was a photo editor at the New York Times Magazine and still is, and I said, Kathy, can I please send you pictures? And she was able to get them in the magazine within two weeks. In 2006, I had been covering the war in Darfur for two years. I first started going in August of 2004. And it was very difficult to access Darfur because the Sudanese government did not want to give visas to journalists. They did not want people to see what was happening. So the best way for a journalist to get into Darfur was to go to Chad and to try and sneak across the border. So I was working with correspondent Lydia Polgreen, and I was often teamed up with her in Africa. And we were pretty tenacious, <laughs> too. And we had heard that there had been a massacre of Sudanese government soldiers in Darfur, and we wanted to report on it. But we couldn't do that without seeing for ourselves, and President Bashir of Sudan had been denying vehemently that there was no massacre. Absolutely no Sudanese government soldiers were killed, he said. So we went to the border and we found a truckload of rebels. And we said to them, please, can you take us across? Into the, we, we need to see the massacre. And they said, well, there are Antonovs, the Russian aircraft, uh, flying overhead by the Sudanese government. And uh, you can go at your own risk, but there's a chance they can bomb. And we said, well, we have to see what's going on. So we jumped in the back of the car, in the truck, and we drove through the desert a few miles. It was not too far in. And when we got there, there were bodies everywhere and all over the desert. And we got back, we didn't spend much time there. Lydia did her reporting and I photographed. And when we got back, we sent the story to the New York Times and it ran the next day. And it was, to me, it really symbolized the power of an image and the power of proof and documenting because Bashir couldn't deny anymore that there had been a massacre. In late 2009, I was embedded with the Medevac. Uh, it's a team that goes in and picks up injured soldiers throughout uh, any conflict zone. And I was with uh, the Medevac team in southern Afghanistan. And it was a story for Time magazine. And we got a call. When you're embedded with the Medevacs, it's a lot of waiting around. You're basically sitting at a base, a remote base, waiting for a call saying someone's been wounded. And then you rush to the, a Black Hawk, jump in, and fly out. So we got a call that there had been an alpha, which means someone was gravely wounded. And we rushed to the medevac. It was late at night, so it was all through night vision goggles. And night vision is very difficult to see through and difficult to focus. So I was trying to focus, and they loaded a young man onto the aircraft. And they were trying to resuscitate him. And I was just trying to shoot through my camera through the night vision goggles. <coughs> And they brought him to a field hospital. It was only a few minutes flight. And for 29 minutes, they tried to save his life. And he had lost almost eight pints of blood. And this is the team trying to resuscitate him. And in the middle of this shoot, it's a very sensitive moment for a photographer to try and document a soldier dying. Because often, troops don't want a journalist there. And they particularly don't want a photographer photographing. And so I was standing at the edge of the bed and trying not to move. And one of the officers came over to me and said, hey, stop shooting. And I looked at him and I said, I have permission to be here, but I will stop. And I put my camera down. And several different soldiers in the room said, no, let her shoot. She needs to be here to document this. And to me, it was an interesting moment because I had been covering the wars since 2001 and embedded with the troops really since 2003. And it, was, it seemed to be a, a turn in the attitude towards journalists that they really did want it document, af documented after so many years at war. They brought blood. He had lost about eight pints of blood. And this is the moment in which he died. And this is a very difficult thing to see and to photograph. And they brought out the flag and prepared his body to go home. And when I got... Uh, very soon after I took these pictures, I was visited in my tent by two uh, press officers from the Marine Corps. 
And they said, you know, you can't send those photos until you get permission from the next of kin. And I said, I know, and I won't. And, and, but it's not possible for a journalist to reach out to the family of a soldier that's been killed. You have to wait for them to contact you. And if they don't want to contact you, they, they don't have to, naturally. And so it was right before Christmas, and I got a call from the father. And it was one of the co hardest conversations I've ever had. And he said, I want to know everything about how my son died. And we had a very long talk. And at the end, he decided he did not want the pictures of his son fo printed. So the only pictures that were ever printed were pictures that did not show his face. In... Uh, 2008, I got a call from a colleague and a friend of mine named Dexter Filkins, who is a very well-known war correspondent. And we had worked together pretty extensively in Iraq and Afghanistan over the years. And I first met him in 2000, so he was a good friend. And Dexter, uh, I don't know if any of you know him or have heard of him, but he speaks to everyone in the same way. And he calls everybody dude. So he called me up and he said, hey man, I got the best story for us. And I said, yeah, Dax. And he said, it's on the Talibanization of Pakistan. And I said, and I sort of rolled my eyes. And I remember my then boyfriend, who's now my husband, was sitting next to me and he's like, you're not gonna meet the Taliban. And I didn't answer, I just didn't say anything. And so Dex said, look, I'm gonna go ahead and set things up and I'll call you when we get the go ahead. So he went in and for almost, it was well over a month, he was arranging access with Haji Namdar, who was a commander in the Pakistani tribal area. And that was an area that was completely off limits to foreign journalists and foreigners in general. And finally he called me up and he said, I think I have the access. And I was on assignment for the New York Times Magazine. So I flew in and two days later, we got the call saying we could go meet Haji Namdar and his men. But the night before we were leaving, they said, the one thing you cannot do is bring a woman. So Dex and I looked at each other, and he, Dex looked at Halim, our translator, who was tortured. And Dex said, we're going together. We're not going to separate. Halim, you figure it out. And so we sort of were sitting there, and Halim was pulling his hair out. And finally, he said, I have an idea. You are Mr. Dexter's wife, and Dexter cannot leave you alone in a strange city, so you must come along. And we said, okay, we're husband and wife. So we get all dressed up, and I'm completely covered, basically wearing a house. And we drive in to the tribal areas, and we, you know, it, we had permission from Haji Namdar to come visit him, and the, the Pashtun code, tribal code, is that if someone invites you to their home, they will protect you with their life. And so we knew that we were protected in Haji Namdar's areas, but we had to pass through two other commander's areas in order to get to him. And had our car broken down, we would have been killed. Well, we assumed we would have been killed. So we get there, and we pull up outside of Haji Namdar's compound, and um, the men go inside and get permission for me to come in. And I go inside, and it was a very small room full of Taliban. And they all had their weapons and rockets and Kalashnikovs, and most of them had one leg, because many of them had lost a leg in fighting and landmines, and had a leg propped up on the wall. And they sort of looked at a woman, and it was very awkward, because women don't usually attend these scenes. And so I sat down in the middle of the room, and, and uh, Dexter was doing his interview, and he said, Haji Namdar, this is my wife. And I, you know, I don't look up and my face is covered and, and Haji Namdar sort of doesn't look up and he says, welcome. And then he says, Dexter says, and you know, my wife happens to have a camera. Do you mind if she takes some photos? <laughs> so I just thought, I cannot believe he's going to believe this. <laughs> and so then about 20 minutes into the interview, everyone starts getting very fidgety. And I thought, oh God, now they're going to kill us. Like we've stayed too long and we're such idiots. How can we think that we're actually going to get through this alive? And so one man walks up to me and he says, Madam, we would like to serve you tea, but we don't know how you can drink the tea through your veil. And so I sort of looked at them and I, and in that part of the world, and hospitality is incredible. So I thought, okay, I knew this moment would come. And so uh, the guy looks at me and he says, I have an idea. Go to the corner of the room, and it's a tiny room, and you can lift your veil, drink your cup of tea, not facing anyone, and then put your veil down and you can come back and join us. And I said, okay. And so that's how I met the Taliban. <laughs>
In November of 2009, I was assigned to do a story on women in Afghanistan for National Geographic. And one issue I really wanted to cover was maternal mortality, because Afghanistan had one of the highest rates of women dying in childbirth in the world. And so I went to the remote province of Badakhshan, and I was, doing, um, I was photographing visits of midwives to remote areas. Often they met in, uh, they would call people to come with their children and pregnant women. Uh, through Friday prayer and announced the visit of a midwife. So I went to these very remote, remote areas. And on the way back, uh, I was driving back with Dr. Ziba, my translator, and we noticed these two women on the side of the road. And anyone who's worked in this area knows that women uh, with unaccompanied by a man is a strange sight. So um, we stopped the car, and Ziba and I ran up the hill and said, what's going on? And it turned out that Nor Nisa, the woman on the right, was in labor and her husband's first wife had died in childbirth, and he was so determined to not let her die in childbirth too that he rented a car. And the reason many of these women die in childbirth is because the distances to a medical facility are so far. So a woman who's in labor who has a complication often has to walk 12 hours to get to a hospital or a clinic or sometimes get on the back of a donkey. So the husband was so determined to get her to a hospital that he rented a car. And that's a lot of money for a villager in Afghanistan. So I said, just get in my car. I'll take you to the hospital. And they said, we can't. We need permission from Nora Nisa's husband. So I looked at Ziba, and luckily there was one road that went through the whole province. And I said, Ziba, go find the husband. She said, OK. So she did find him. And she brought him back, and the whole family got in my car, and she delivered at the hospital. And everyone always asked me if I continued photographing and if I photographed her delivery, and I did not. Because the minute in which I changed the story and I brought her to the hospital, I thought it was unethical to keep photographing because perhaps the story would have been different had I, uh, had I not taken them. In March of, uh, in February of 2011, I went to Libya to cover the uprising. Uh, I had missed a large part of the Arab Spring and had missed Egypt because I had been working in other countries and I really wanted to get to, to Libya to cover the uprising. So I snuck in, like many journalists, through Egypt. It was the only way to get there because Gaddafi didn't want journalists covering the uprising, naturally. And we snuck in and we started covering Benghazi and moving east towards the front line. And I'm showing this picture not because it's a great picture, but just because I want, people always ask, what does a front line look like? And in Libya, actually, this is what the front line looked like. It was one road that cut through the desert from east to west, and the rebels, who were clearly not very trained and not very well equipped with weapons, were uh, students, teachers, engineers, and they had started this popular uprising. And a few, uh, about a mile in the, in the distance were Qaddafi's troops who were heavily armed and were using airstrikes. So one day we were on the front line and we heard a helicopter gunship coming in and it came right above us and started spraying the ground all around us. And I was hiding behind a car with John Moore who is a very seasoned and very good war photographer. And I was sort of terrified just next to him. And we were both trying to photograph and clearly aware of the fact that a car does not provide any protection. And some of the men in front of us were just throwing rocks up in the air at the helicopter, and some were just shooting up in the air. And I knew at that point that Libya would be different and would be very difficult. So this is on a typical day of heavy combat. There were artillery rounds and mortars landing all around us, and we hid in those cement silos for protection. And when you heard the aircraft, this is generally what it looked like. Everyone would sort of look up and hope that a bomb didn't land next to us. And often it did. It landed very close by, 100 feet, 200 feet. But we worked on the front line for about two weeks, photographing the wounded and, and just positions as they shifted. And on March 15th, I was kidnapped by Qaddafi's troops with three colleagues for the New York Times, Anthony Shadid, Steve Farrell, and Tyler Hicks. We had been covering Ajdabia, which was a city along the front line, and we had a sense that uh, the city was going to fall. And we were working in two separate cars. Uh, me and Tyler were in one car, and Anthony and Steve were in another. And we were covering the fighting and covering the civilian toll, going to the hospital, interviewing the doctors. 
And uh, the driver that we were working with, his brother got shot on the front line. And so he emptied Anthony and Steve's belongings on the side of the road. And we all ended up in one vehicle. So four journalists in one vehicle becomes slightly complicated because everyone has a different idea of how long to stay. Um, and so we continued working and the fighting was coming closer and closer. And eventually, by the time we made a decision to pull out and go east towards Benghazi, Qaddafi's troops came not from behind us, but they flanked the desert and set up a checkpoint in front of us. And we ran directly into a checkpoint. And at that point, uh, the rebels that we had been with started opening fire on that checkpoint. And so we were caught in the crossfire and in a wall of bullets. And immediately, uh, everyone was ripped out of the car. They sort of left me in the car, uh, as they did when I was kidnapped in Iraq in 2004. I think they often don't know what to do with a woman. So I was sort of just left in the car. And eventually, I crawled across the car and got out the same side that the men, my colleagues, had gotten out. And immediately, one of Gaddafi's troops was on me trying to pull my cameras. And, and there were bullets everywhere. And so I ran for cover behind this building. We all ran for cover behind this building. And this picture I'm showing you because two weeks after we were released, Brian Denton, who's a freelance photographer for the New York Times, went back to the site to try to look for the body of our driver, which was never recovered. And we were taken almost exactly where his name is in the lower left corner. And we had to run over behind that cement building. And we were asked to lie face down on the ground. And they were deciding whether to execute us. And in the end, they decided not to execute us. And uh, they tied us up and blindfolded us and put us in vehicles back on the front line and watched for hours while artillery and uh, bullets rained around us. And eventually they shifted our position. And over the course of about six days, we were beaten up, tied up, uh, blindfolded, threatened with death. I, as a woman, was groped repeatedly. But we lived, and our driver did not. Uh, and we were released on March 21st. And when Brian went back two weeks later, uh, he found my shoe on the side of the road. And that's my shoe without the laces. They had used my laces to tie me up. That's it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and my microphone fell out of my ear. So it's complicated that one. <laughs> it's not an easy microphone. You want me to help? Okay. Oh, upside down. Upside down. Uh huh. <laughs> Sorry. It's very complicated. This has been the hardest part of the night. Yeah. <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> um, well, why don't you? You know, I was just listening to all the things that you have done, but I don't really understand why you've done them. <laughs> you grew up in this incredibly artistic community. I think I have it, finally, sorry. Um, in this family that was like super creative, but it doesn't give you any indication that you're going to make a living of sort of putting your life at risk over and over and over. Were there any signs as a kid that no. you had this kind of courage? No. Um, no, and it just, it was never something I set out to do. I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I want to be a war photographer. I never had those aspirations at all. And in fact, I still don't think of myself as a war photographer. I always uh, think of myself as a horrible war photographer because when I start getting shot at, I'm the first person on the ground hiding. <laughs> and I never remember to actually shoot in those moments. So um, I think it was just something where I was interested in certain stories, and they happened to be either in war zones or on the margins of war, and I would go to do them and then somehow get sucked into covering a more comprehensive story. And eventually, at some point, I had amassed uh, this body of work. So you were never distracted by anything more calm and sedate in visually? <laughs> um, I mean, what, yeah, what was I've always, and I still do bodies of work that are, have nothing to do with war. I just, my 
personal calling and the th what I feel strongly about is covering uh, humanitarian crises, injustices against women, children, civilians, civilian casualties. So that takes up a large part of my time, especially now when we're, you know, at a time when our country has been at war in two countries for the last 13 years. So. I think I do do other stories, but I spend the bulk of my time covering these stories. Do you remember the first uh, serious picture that you took? Serious. Well, something that <clears throat> you felt like you, what you wanted to express came across. I mean, was it a personal? I think probably uh, the transgender prostitutes. I think that body of work was the first body of work that I really, uh, was able to uh, spend a lot of time getting to know the community, the women, the, the, the rhythms, and really trying to figure out how to photograph them in a way that they were not just a, a, a community that the reader couldn't get into. I, I want to, one of my goals is to try and create an in for the reader, to try and have them have a better understanding of a subject that maybe they didn't understand. Do you, were there photographers who you felt inspired by in those days? Yeah. Were there people you were kind of imitating or? Sure, so there was a real range of photographers actually. Um, Nan Golden, uh, Mary Ellen Mark, Sally Mann, uh, Jim Noctaway, who's a great war photographer, Kudelka, Gilles Perez. Um, a lot of different types of photographers, not necessarily war photographers, not just a combination, Sebastian Salgado. I feel like there are, that we are inundated with images of tragedy and terror as, you know, Americans or just any mm -hmm. sort of media uh, viewer. And I think your images really stand out for their artistic quality that is layered on top of it. Did that, did, did that come you know, just very naturally, or did you feel like, well, I wanna, I wanna tell this story, but I also wanna tell it in my way? Well, I want to tell a story in a way that will get the reader to engage and ask questions and not necessarily just turn the page because it's such a violent image. So often I'm in a situation where a lot is happening around me and I will try and look for the quiet moments or the intimate moments or moments that are sometimes beautiful even in the most tragic scenes. Do you feel like your gender has, um, do you feel, it sounds to me like you're, that's kind of a feminine way of looking at things. I don't know. I think there are a lot of male photographers who We're actually looking are looking for the, the quiet same. parts. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think I've it's not gender specific. I think what is um, where my gender plays a role is is usually accessing women in the Muslim world or on really sensitive women's stories. So you think, on balance, it's been an advantage to be a female in a war zone? I, th I think, not necessarily in a war zone, I think it's a, an advantage to be a female in the places where I work. And, I, and because I work mostly in the Muslim world. So I don't know how many of you have already read the book like I have, but the, from her presentation, you might think that the book is um, one very serious, hard look at war and tragedy and complicated conflict, but there are also a lot of really funny bits where as a woman, she at one point she's a, in a position of having to order body armor when she's been up all night. And I just wanted to quickly read a little bit of this because she doesn't want to read it. But <laughs> um, so she's writing, tell me who you're writing your email to. Okay, so I was in South Korea and I was doing a story for the New York Times Magazine on North Korean refugees fleeing to South Korea and it was, <laughs> uh, I think, January of 2003. So everyone was sort of gearing up for the war in Iraq and I so had So she's in South agency. Korea but she needs to get to Iraq. Right, I knew I was going to go to Iraq and I was with Corbis at the time, which was a big agency and, and my editor at Corbis was writing me emails saying, do you want to embed with the military? We can get a position. Do you want, can, you have to order your body armor. And I was working, I was shooting like 17 hour days, actually 
which consisted mostly of singing karaoke with a bunch of North Korean refugees because that's <laughs> all they wanted to do. And I didn't have a translator. So all, literally, I would go and sing Wham! and Madonna and <laughs> with a bunch of refugees <laughs> the entire day. But it was long, there were long shoot days. And, and so then I had to order body armor. So she, she says, Scott, I'm trying to buy body armor for my impending departure to Iraq, and I'm starting to break out in hives. I called Ake or AKE <laughs> war outfitters like you suggested and they put me on hold for about three minutes knowing I was calling from Korea so I hung up then I checked out the website you recommended I'm not sure if I just tried to read Korean basically I have no idea what I'm looking out at ballistic six-point adjustable tactical armor please understand that this language is not familiar to me I grew up in Connecticut was raised by hairdressers <laughs> Would it be possible for you to call Second Chance in the States and explain to them that I'm a photographer, I'm going to Baghdad with the US troops or into northern Iraq and God knows which terrorists and tribal leaders. I'm not as worried about bullets as I am about shrapnel. So she goes on. So he basically makes, needs to know, she says, she says I don't think um, the reception would send me anything to measure my head at 1.30 a.m. because it would take them about three hours with the Korean English Dictionary to figure out what the hell I'm asking for, <laughs> and I would surely jump out the window before going through that process right now. So, let's say I have a medium head. As for the vest, my waist is 29 inches, my chest is 34, and I have big boobs. And I have no, I have no idea what the distance between my nipples is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Call if you have any more questions, and please let me know the cost of the vest before you go ahead and get it. <laughs> Which, so I feel like that passage just shows you all of the things that are going on on top of just picking up the camera and you know taking yeah. an emotional shot. Yeah. Um, were you always doing 20 things at once like that? Yes, and I still am. It doesn't ever go away. Yeah, and I, I was really learning there. I mean, that was the first war I was going to cover from start to finish. I'd covered the fall of the Taliban, but it was sort of, uh, I would go in and out, and I was in Pakistan, and then went into the fall of Kandahar, but it was different. I mean, we were sort of gearing up. We Everybody knew that the that we were going into Iraq, and so, it was confusing, and I was sort of learning on the fly. How did you learn what to do? I Luckily, um, it is one of the few professions where you can have great mentors and learn on the job with other more experienced photographers. So I had a lot of people who took me under their wing and taught me. They weren't competitive? Isn't everyone going after... Not, I, yes and no. I think, you know, at a certain point, we're all, we all have access to the same things around the front line. And so a lot of it is just sticking together for safety. I feel like um, I maybe imagined, or I imagine that it must take a lot of courage, a lot of strength of character to go into these places and feel like you can record them for other people or interpret them for other people. And so later on in the book, when she is called by the MacArthur Foundation to um, have them tell her that she has won the prestigious MacArthur Award, she almost hangs up on him saying that you have the wrong person. And to, I, I was having trouble in my mind, since I hadn't met you when I was reading it, reconciling the, the force of personality that must push you through these experiences of shooting while there's tragedy all around you, and then the person who doesn't believe that they're getting this award. How do those two, do those mean, two coexist? Well, I think that um, in this profession and in throughout the last 15 years, I've just been shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and I, and I go on a story and I send the pictures to the New York Times, I beg and plead for it to make the front page, it doesn't make the front page, then I go to the next story and I keep going through that process and I rarely have time to look back. And so I never, I, I never really know if my work has impact, if people know my photos, if it's making a difference, but I know that I'm so driven to make those things happen and so, in 2009, I got this phone call and I was living in Turkey at the time and I had just had this horrible conversation with an editor of mine at National Geographic who was sort of questioning how I was going to approach the story. And um, 
And I just felt like it was a really patronizing conversation. And I hung up the phone, and my phone rang, and it was a US number. And I thought it was my credit card. And I thought they would say, like, you've missed a payment. And I thought, oh. And so I picked up the phone, and I was sort of exasperated. And he said, this is the president of the MacArthur Foundation. And you know, this is the first phone call I'm making as the new president. And you've won a MacArthur Fellowship. And I sort of was silent. And he said, do you know what that means? <laughs> and I said, and I said, do you have the right person? And he said, you were born November 13, 1973 in Norwalk, Connecticut. Well, I was born in Westport, but the hospital was in Norwalk. And so <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, that's me. And he said, well, you have one of MacArthur. And, I, and, and so then I was silent again. And he said, do you want me to tell you what that means? And I said, yeah, can you tell me? Because I just wanted to hear it. And so it is, it's, it's a a lot of money. And so it was, I had always struggled. My whole career, I never knew if I would get another assignment, if I would have money in the bank. And I was sort of, I never thought about money because I was so enamored and so passionate about my career. But as I grew into an adult, I actually had to worry about money. And so it was, uh, it was a great conversation, oh, well <laughs> but I deserved. did not believe him, no. <laughs> At another point in the book that you write, the more I worked, the more I achieved, and the more I wanted. Do you still feel that sense now? Because that can be, you can sort of read that a couple of different ways. One could be that there's a sort of unsatisf or insatiability to it that I think I'm uh, pretty tortured when it comes to my work, and not, ironically, my work as a writer. Writing this book was actually a pleasure, but photographing, because for me, I'm a photographer, and so I put this immense weight on trying to get the perfect picture and the composition and the light and the access, and I always think I'm failing. And if I'm on a story, I feel like I should be on another story, and if I'm not on a story, I feel like, why am I not working? So I'm always sort of tormented, and it's not an insatiability as much as it is I just don't feel like I'm doing enough, and enough as a journalist and enough as a photographer. So, yeah. And none of that feeling has changed since you had your son three years ago? Uh, it has, it's sort of redirected. It's still the same, but I'm trying not to go uh, to the front line as much. So I will still cover war. I'm trying to do quieter stories as well. But I will go to Afghanistan, for example, and well, I mean, it's not even an issue because the US troops have basically pulled out. So it's really a different time now. I mean, I don't believe in covering war just for the sake of going to war. I believe in covering war because there are certain issues there that I want to cover. And that was very, um, that was even more pressing when there were American troops there because I felt like the American public needed to see what was happening on the front line, especially with, with American troops. Now most of the combat troops have been pulled out and so it's not really an issue. And do you talk to your son about, is he old enough to understand any of <clears throat> what you do or where you've been? I mean, he's three, so no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank God. And I don't think I remember anything before I was four, so I'm just hoping he doesn't. <laughs> You're good till then? <laughs> Get a little leeway. Um, tell me how, a lot of this book is also about her romantic life. Failed. <laughs> uh, uh, well, until now. Until now. <laughs> And uh, tell me when you decided that you actually wanted to have a child, what did it take? Well, I mean, first of all, it, it's, um, it's very hard to lead this life and have a relationship. So a child was always something that I felt like one day I wanted to have a family, but I had no idea how I would get from point A to point B. And so I would date and then inevitably I would say to whoever I was dating, okay, I'll be home in three months. I'm going to Iraq. And when I came home, there were other women there. <laughs> I mean, it was a disaster. And that went on for years. And it was my fault because I was not committed to those relationships. I was committed to my work. And you can't ask someone to wait for months on end. So finally, um, I had sort of, in my early 30s, I just thought, okay, I'm I'm just going to be single the rest of my life because this is never going to work out. And I'm, I love my work and that's my calling. So, and then I met my husband and I was in my, I was about, I think I was 33 when I met Paul 
And we uh, were both dating other people and we became friends and we became very close friends over the course of nine months. And then we had both broken up with our respective others. And, and he's and, also in the news business. Yeah, he was a journalist at Reuters for 16 years. And so he was running the bureau in Turkey. And uh, he was very, very committed to his work there. And one day he just said, okay, this is ridiculous. We should be together. And I just was said, that's crazy. I'm not even attracted to you. And then <laughs> I, uh, and then he sort of convinced me that I was, and then I, and, and now I really am. I mean, it, just, it sort of was one of those moments where I just, we, it, I just, yeah. Maybe you weren't paying you, completely you attention. Realize. Yeah. I wasn't, I think because I had always dated completely the wrong people. And then there was like the perfect person and I just didn't see it and I and my friends used to joke and say Paul's too nice for you there's no way you're gonna date Paul because he's a really good guy and so they tried to stop us from getting together and then we did get together and we got married and we're very happy so. but <laughs> didn't it take you being kidnapped uh, <laughs> it's in the book it kind of seems like when you were kidnapped is when you decided yeah maybe oh, I, I forgot to get on question. that I forgot the baby question so um <laughs> Yeah, I was so happy Paul about Paul distracted love you. It's all right. So, um, so from the day we started dating, Paul, who is Swedish, and uh, he really wanted a family. And he sort of laid it out in a very pragmatic way and said, basically, if you don't want children, we shouldn't date. And so <laughs> I said, no, yes, I do, but not right now. And so we got married, and I was 35, and every few months he would say when are we going to have a child and I'd say not now and and so finally in um, in January of 2011 we sort of made this agreement that we would start trying and so I didn't go home for four months <laughs> I basically was so terrified at the prospect of getting pregnant that I just never went home and I was in um, I went yeah I went from um, South Sudan to, with George Clooney, which my husband was not very happy about. South Sudan, <laughs> to um, Iraq, to Afghanistan, to Bahrain, to Libya. And in Libya, I was kidnapped. And so uh, on like the third day we were being held captive, we didn't know if our families knew that we were even alive. I mean, we had no idea what was going on in the outside world. And, and we were all, there was a moment where we were all put in a prison cell together, me, Anthony, Steve, and Tyler. And, uh, Anthony, and Ty Anthony and Steve had infants at home. Their wives had two-month-old babies at home. And, and uh, Tyler was still single. He had a girlfriend at the time. And, and we were all sort of just talking about, well, if we get out, X. And, and I sort of looked at them and just said, well, if we get out, I will be so fat in nine months. I'm sure I'll finally be pregnant. And in fact, I gave birth 10 months after I was released. So... <laughs> Not recommended. I'm sure there are a lot of other questions about kidnapping and Libya, and I want to make sure that I leave time Love. for them and not hog <laughs> Lindsay to myself. Does someone want to be brave enough to raise their hand and go first? I'm going to start right here in the front. So I'm curious what, if anything, at this point, other than having a child, gives you pause about going to some of these places. You know, you've been kidnapped twice. You've seen, I'm sure, a lot of people that you know be kidnapped and worse. When you see Tim Hetherington and Chris Andros die on the same day, does that? Yeah, exactly. I give mean, you pause? I, that's exactly what gives me pause. I mean, I think that, um, and also, um, I mean, I'm joking about it, but the reason why I finally decided to slow down was because I was starting to lose a lot of friends. Uh, Joao Silva, who was a mentor to me, lost his legs in Afghanistan. Um, people were getting kidnapped all around me, friends, colleagues, uh, people I didn't know. And so, yeah, that was a very uh, important time for me. Question over here on the right. Hi, I have a technical question. Uh, the New York Times Magazine article said that you carry a lot of lenses on you, and can't, you have several cameras. I just want to know what equipment you're actually using. So I shoot with Nikon, and I usually carry two bodies. And depending on the kind of story I'm working on, I'll carry a different amount of lenses. So if, for example, I am going on a seven-hour patrol with the military, I'll carry 
probably two zooms, uh, a 24 to 70 and 80 to, or 70 to 200. Um, if I'm doing a National Geographic story and I can work slowly, I'll have uh, fixed lenses because the quality is better. So I'll have a 28-1.4, a 35-1.4, um, and I'll usually carry a zoom always. Next question on the side. <clears throat> Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Hi. Um, my question was, um, that came up for me was during the slideshow um, when you were doing the story about the maternal, mater um, the maternal mat mortality rate and mm -hmm. the women that you saw on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you mentioned that um, to follow them to the hospital that the story could be different um, and, uneth and possibly unethical um, to continue shooting. Can you say more about that? How could the story have been different and how would it have been unethical? So I think it's really up to the, the, the journalist or the photographer to make that call. I, uh, I try to not insert myself into a story and I think most uh, photographers and journalists that I respect do the same. But I think when you are in a situation where you can save someone's life just by giving them a ride somewhere, then that takes priority over actually the story, and so in that case, uh, when we first approached them, I asked permission to shoot, and I took a few pictures, only four or five frames in that series, and then I stopped shooting. And so um, I could have kept shooting, and I, I probably would have put that in the caption that I gave them a ride. So I think it doesn't, I think the important thing is to just be clear about what happens in the story. Up here on the right. I'm wondering if there's um, any places that you wouldn't go to cover a story or stories that you've turned down and why? Uh, Syria. I won't go to Syria now. I think it's just too dangerous. I think it's uh, almost impossible to cover without getting kidnapped. And I think uh, even now at this point when I'm going close to the Syrian border in Turkey, uh, Jordan, all of, all of the countries on the border, I, I do a lot of homework before I go, and I talk to a lot of local translators, drivers, uh, correspondents who have been there, and find out exactly how dangerous it is, where ISIS is, are they coming across the border to kidnap people and bring them back into Syria, because that's happening more and more. And so I think that, um, that question changes by the week. Um, so there are places where maybe I would go today, but I won't go in a week. Next question on this side. Hello. Um, actually, it was probably a similar question that was just answered in that sense. Is So, for example, in sports photography, um, it's often that um, most of the better sports photographers would know the sport so they can anticipate what to shoot, for example. Um, in your line of business, can you describe the type of preparation you'd have, let's say, about the historical or cultural significance of a place? Um, and, and I think you've answered at least right now the immediate portions, right? But yeah. what kind of homework do you do, for example? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I send a lot of emails and make phone calls to colleagues and friends who are currently working in that area um, and talk to locals and find out what the situation is. And then, of course, I download all the recent articles and, and any information I can find on that place and just try and get as much information as I can to figure out not only... Um, who I will work with and who's trustworthy and how to operate there, um, but what the cultural issues are. What do I wear? What do I have to pack? Um, what kind of hijab do I need? Do I need a, an abaya? Do I need just to cover my head? Do I, I always try and err on conservative, so usually when I go to a place, I dress pretty conservatively. Question over here on the right. Do you ever have uh, issues with feeling like you might be objectifying your subjects? And if so, how do you think about that? Yeah, I have those issues all the time. I think um, I'm, I, I f I'm worried about that. I, I go in and I always ask permission from whoever I'm photographing. I introduce myself, I explain why I'm there, and I leave it up to them as to whether they want to be photographed. And, and I take my time. I mean, I talk to people for a long time, if I can, if it's not a, a front line or a place, a story that's evolving very quickly. I usually spend a fair amount of time talking to people and getting to know them so that I don't feel like I'm objectifying them because I do 
want the pictures to reflect the, the truest situation I can capture. Next question up here. Over on this side. Oh. Uh, uh, it's you're hard a to real, see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> different for you down there. You're a real inspiration. Uh, thank you. I want to say thank you for... I remember listening to you speak on the radio back in 2011, right after you had been released, and you made a candid comment in response to a journalist's question about the effect this has on your family and your loved ones. And it was at a time in my life before I went to a dangerous place. And you basically said exactly what the title of your book is. You're like, this is what I do. And I think that they get that. So thank you for, for that and for thank not you. glamorizing it. Thank you. Uh, the question I have for you is with regard to advocacy and the role that you feel like you play and want to play in advocating for the, um, the need for an, uh, more greater attention on the deaths of journalists and policy change regarding that around the world. Uh, I think it's interesting that you saw a shift in the attitude in American soldiers, but obviously we're seeing uh, gr a greater degree of targeting uh, around the world. And with CPJ and the work that Mike Camber does with the Bronx, Docu Do Bronx Documentary Center in relation to Sebastian Unger and Risk, like, it seems like more photographers are uh, either getting out of the game or finding ways to advocate for mm -hmm. uh, more attention and more mm -hmm. uh, training. So, yeah, and Charlie Sennett, who uh, I don't even know who he's working for these days. He was way back when he was at the Boston Globe, also just started something. And I think, um, I think a lot of journalists increasingly, as we see our colleagues get beheaded and killed and kidnapped, um, are, are moved to action. And so a lot of them are starting fundraisers, how to train young journalists, um, how to give them courses on how to operate in war zones, things that we've never typically had. A lot of the more seasoned war correspondents are, are feeling like they need to start teaching people and offering these training courses. And so for me personally, um, I'm in touch with so many of those organizations. I often donate prints every year to each one of them for fundraising. Um, I will speak on behalf of whatever they ask me to speak on. Um, I think it was two years ago, Aidan Sullivan, who's at Getty Images, uh, had the idea to start a movement called A Day Without News, and what would the world be like if we didn't have journalists? And it was in response to the intentional targeting of many journalists like Marie Colvin, like possibly Tim and Chris, uh, in Libya. And so we started this movement and, and the idea was to make it a UN resolution, to make it a crime to intentionally kill a journalist. And we got the resolution to the UN floor. So I think all of those things, everyone is sort of playing their part and it will take time, but it's becoming, people are talking about it. Do you feel like your pictures have become more, they're advocating for more, or are you still just trying to record what's happening in front of you? I mean, it depends. There are issues that I care about, like maternal mortality. So if you call that advocating, that I cover stories on it once a year. I just wondered if within the frame it seems like it's becoming more... Uh, within the frame, no. I'll still cover it the way I see it, but I will cover issues that I care about. Question up here on the right. You, you mentioned uh, Sally Mann and Nan Gordon as photographers who inspired you. Could you envision maybe five or ten years from now that you will stop working as a war photographer and that you may um, start doing work that I would qualify almost as more personal about your family, about friends, about people around you? Is, it, is this possible? I don't know. I mean, I don't ever rule anything out. I think I just go with what feels right at the time. So sometimes, you know, I do do personal work. I, I in fact, have a 101-year-old and a 97-year-old grandmother, uh, two grandmothers, and I, and I record them and make videos of them and, and photograph them all the time. Um, and I do personal work, and I do other stories that have nothing to do with war, like on healthcare in America. So those are issues that um, I do. I don't see them as me totally moving in one direction or another. I think it's just I go with what I believe I need to be covering at that time. So it's hard for me to s answer that because I think it changes. When you come home from a trip, do you put your camera away or your yeah. son and your husband like, no, no pictures? No, yeah, I don't look at my camera when I go home. I, I don't even, I barely take pictures of my son and my husband takes all the family pictures. <laughs> I'm horrible when I get home because I just, the last thing I want to do is look at a camera. 
Well, because we have time for two more questions. Question over here on the right. So um, I imagine when you go out with, uh, with troops, some of the time they might perceive you as, you know, a, a, a positive presence bringing something, something worthwhile to their, to their party. Other times I imagine you might get viewed as kind of like a, a loose caboose they have to keep in tow and, and they have to watch out for and be burdensome. <clears throat> What's the proportion of that that you see? And also, do you feel that proportion would be different if you were a male photographer? Yes, uh, I will start with the last question first. Yes, I think that um, because uh, it's a very male world, being on the front line, especially in Afghanistan, and that doesn't really exist anymore because, again, the troops are, are basically gone. Um, they don't go on these patrols anymore. But at the time in which I was doing a lot of these embeds, it was very clear when I would show up or and if I would show up with another female colleague, the guys would just sort of look at us like, oh, God, the chicks are here. And so, I, I, you know, you really have to prove yourself. You have to say, like, I can keep up. I'm not going to start crying when the bullets start flying. I'm going to be able to do this. And, and you really have to gain their trust. And so I think it's important. It's like anything else. You have to show them that you can hold your own and that you have experience doing that. And so I have seen that and, and I just end up, you know, trying to prove that I can do it. You don't actually say that. You no. You show it. No. Right? No. Okay. No. I just <laughs> say, okay, I can tell. And even, they would never admit to it. But of course, you look at someone and you can look in their eyes and they sort of are looking at you like, oh God, and she's five feet tall, which is like, you know, it's, I mean, it's very rigorous. You and know? what about when you were pregnant? With the, were they aware of that? I did not embed when I was pregnant. Oh, you didn't? No. Okay. I did. Um, I was doing other stories, but I didn't go with the military. When you were kidnapped, you were telling me before that um, they had beaten you for four days, and then when they were shifting you to the Department of, mm. what was it, Foreign Ministry or mm -hmm. the Interior, mm. um, they had Foreign to ask ministry. Lindsay, well, you got treated differently so, than the men. So um, we... The kidnapping was sort of split up into two parts, really. The first three days, more or less, we were shifted along the front line. It was very violent, and they, um, every time we were shifted hands, they had to reassert their power over us and fear and would beat us and, and tell us they were about to execute us. And finally, they flew us in a military aircraft to Tripoli, and it was an incredibly violent transfer. I mean, we were... Uh, zip tied and tied to the walls of the aircraft and flown to Tripoli and when we got to the tarmac they beat the hell out of my colleagues and for me I was being very aggressively groped and then uh, they they first put us in a paddy wagon and um, we were blindfolded but we could tell we were in a paddy wagon and actually Anthony Shadid who spoke Arabic translated all of this after because he was eavesdropping and um, and they were fighting. They're basically, there was a fight between the Ministry of Interior and the Foreign Ministry as to who would get us. And uh, we ended up with the Foreign Ministry, which was good because Ministry of Information, Ministry of Interior was known for torture. And so <laughs> we ended up in the back of this GMC, and they took us to a series of places. And eventually, we end up in this sort of apartment under house arrest. And when we get there. Um, we were sitting in this place and they say, well, we would like to go buy you some things. Like, you know, we had nothing. They had stolen everything from us, the shoes off our feet, uh, our phone, everything, shampoo, everything. So, um, you know, we, they asked, there was a guy who went around and said, what do you need? And of course I said, coffee and cream and sugar and shampoo and a toothbrush. And, uh, and he looked at me and he said, do you need some feminine things? And I looked at him and I was like, you guys have been beating the shit out of us for three days and you want to buy me tampons? Like, are you kidding me? And so I just looked at him and I was like, no. And then he comes back. They come back with like 25 bags of groceries. And I remember the four of us looked at each other and we were like, we are never getting released. Like, there was enough food for a year. And so they brought me... Uh, they brought all the men Adidas tracksuits, and I was sort of very excited when I saw them pulling out Adidas tracksuits because I thought, great, what color did they get me? And I was all ready. And, and then for me, they pulled out an extra, extra large velour 
a tan sweatsuit with teddy bears <laughs> all over it. <laughs> with cursive writing saying, the magic girl. And so, I was so pissed. I was like, I can't believe the only thing I have to wear is the magic girl. And so I basically would hand wash my jeans every day and my other shirt and then put on the magic girl and then put my other clothes back. And I still have the sweatshirt. Kept Shall it. we end there or do you have one more question? Oh wait, they brought me underwear that said, shake it up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was good. And there were briefs. They went from like here to here. I was like, uh. -uh. <laughs> I think we have one more question over here. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I was hoping you could just speak on uh, some of the stories that you've done down in Africa and the shoots down there. Oh, that's a big question. I've done. Um, I've done. I started working in Africa in Darfur in August of 2004 and ended up covering the war in Darfur for six years. I went every year until 2009. And in fact, when the ICC handed down the indictment to President Bashir, I was one of two Western journalists, uh, Eddie Sanders for the LA Times and I, were the only two uh, non-Muslim journalists allowed into Darfur at the time. And it was an incredible time. And, um, and I started covering Congo, the DRC, uh, in 2006 uh, with Lydia Polgreen and we went back for three straight years. And then uh, I started working in Sierra Leone covering maternal health issues. And now I've worked in many different African countries, but I always try and go with a real purpose and a story that I'm working on. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Lindsay will be signing books immediately after the program in the atrium. Tabitha, Lindsay, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.